Carbohydrate molecules aren't only used as energy molecules and they're not only used to actually provide the matrix around the cell structure and integrity, but they can also be used to actually modify the properties and increase the functionality of protein molecules. So the process by which we covalently attach a carbohydrate component onto a protein molecule is known as protein glycosylation. And this type of molecule is known as the glycoprotein. Now, previously, we also discussed proteoglycans. And we said that proteoglycans are also an example of biological molecules that contain a protein component as well as a sugar component. So what exactly is the difference between a proteoglycan and a glycoprotein? Well, in the case of glycoproteins, the sugar component makes up a much smaller percentage by mass of the biological molecule than compared to the proteoglycan. And this is the main difference between these two types of biological molecules. So glycoproteins are an important class of biological molecules that play a variety of different roles inside our cells and inside our body as we'll see in future lectures. And they can be found along the cell membrane, they can also be found in the extracellular matrix. For instance, in our blood plasma, which is an example of an extracellular matrix, we'll find many different types of glycoproteins that play a variety of different roles. Now, how exactly does the process of protein glycosylation actually take place? This is what we're going to focus on in the remaining of this lecture. Now, oligosaccharides are basically very small polysaccharides that can have anywhere from three monosaccharides to, let's say, 12 monosaccharides. Now, oligosaccharides can be attached onto proteins, and we attach them onto proteins via specific amino acids. So, there are only three different amino acids that we can actually modify by covalently attaching these sugar molecules, and this includes asparagine amino acids, serine amino acids, and threonine amino acids. And out of these three types of attachments, we only have two types of bonds that can actually form. We can have the N-glycosidic bond that can form between the asparagine and the sugar, or we can have the O-glycosidic bond that can form between the oxygen on the serine or threonine and that corresponding sugar molecule. So oligosaccharides may be attached to proteins via the nitrogen atom on the side chain of asparagine and this is called the N-glycosidic linkage or via the oxygen atom of the side chain of threonine or serine and that particular corresponding oligosaccharide and this is known as the O-glycosidic linkage. Now, to see exactly what we mean by all that, let's take a look at these two diagrams. So, in this particular case, we have the asparagine amino acid. So this is the side chain of asparagine. And notice we have an N-glycosidic bond between the nitrogen atom on the side chain of asparagine and the anomeric carbon, carbon number one of this modified glucose molecule, which happens to be the N, acetylglycosamine. So this green bond is called the N-glycosidic bond because it's between the nitrogen of the side chain of the asparagine amino acid and the anomeric carbon, carbon number one, of that glucose amino acid. Now, in this particular case, we have the O-glycosidic bond, and we call it the O-glycosidic bond because it's between the oxygen of the side chain of serine, or also we can have threonine, and this anomeric carbon number one of this modified galactose sugar molecule, which is known as N-acetylgalactosamine. So these are the two types of linkages that we can have in glycoprotein molecules. 
So along a protein molecule, we can have many of these asparagine, threonine, and serine amino acids. The question is, how exactly does a cell actually know which one of these amino acids must be glycosylated? Well, the way that it knows is it looks at the sequence next to that particular amino acid. So the sides at which glycosylation takes place depends on the sequence of amino acids acids adjacent to that particular amino acid. So in the case of asparagine, the cell will only modify the asparagine and attach that particular sugar molecule if the sequence around is a specific sequence. And these are the two sequences that the cell uses. So right next to the asparagine, ASN is asparagine, we have to have an arbitrary X, so an arbitrary amino acid where X cannot be proline and right next to this arbitrary X we have to have either threonine or serine so only if the sequence is like these two sequences will the asparagine actually be modified on top of that what also determines the amino acids where we modify is the actual structure of that protein and the cell that is actually carrying out that protein glycosylation process. So we see that it also depends, the sites of glycosylation also depends on the type of cell that is producing that protein and on the overall structure of that protein itself. Now, what exactly is the general process by which protein glycosylation actually takes place inside the organelles of our cell and which organelles are responsible for the process of protein glycosylation? So, let's take a look at the following diagram. There are two organelles that play a role in the process of glycosylation. We have the rough endoplasmic reticulum as well as the Golgi apparatus, the Golgi complex. Complex. Now, within our endoplasmic reticulum, this is where the N linkages are actually formed. So, N linked glycosylation between the asparagine and that respective oligosaccharide begins at the endoplasmic reticulum and is completed at the Golgi apparatus. On the other hand, the O linkages are only formed exclusively and entirely inside the Golgi apparatus. Now, to see exactly how the process takes place, let's take a look at this diagram and let's begin on the endoplasmic reticulum. So, along the outer membrane of this or along the outer section of the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, so on the cytoplasmic side, so this is the cytoplasm, and on the cytoplasmic side of the endoplasmic reticulum, we have these ribosomes shown by these dots. So let's suppose at this ribosome, we begin the process of protein synthesis on the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. And as we continually synthesize that protein strand, the protein strand moves into the lumen of that endoplasmic reticulum. So the lumen is the inside portion of that endoplasmic reticulum. And once inside the endoplasmic reticulum, there are special enzymes, complex of enzymes, which are responsible for actually creating the end linkage between asparagine and the respective oligosaccharide. So we essentially attach those sugar molecules onto asparagine via the, L, uh, the end linkage inside the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, once we form the protein, the protein then leaves the endoplasmic reticulum. It goes into a special transport vesicle that carries it onto this side, which is known as the cis side of the Golgi apparatus. So once on the cis side of once on the cis side of the Golgi apparatus, which is this side here, it basically moves along the Golgi apparatus and at its end as it moves, that particular uh, N-linked 
uh, sugar molecule is even further modified and on top of that we also form the O glycosidic linkages between either the serine and threonine and that particular sugar molecule and this takes place inside the Golgi apparatus. So inside the Golgi we form the O linkages and we also continue modifying those sugars which have been formed via the N linkages. And once they essentially end up on the trans side of the Golgi apparatus, so the side where the Golgi receives these molecules is the cis, the side where it sends these completely and fully modified glycoproteins is at the trans side. And it sends them to three different locations. So depending on the sequence of amino acids and the structure of that particular glycoprotein, these glycoproteins, once they're, once they're modified in the Golgi apparatus and once they're sorted, they can be sent either to the cell membrane where, it can, where, where they can actually be embedded into the cell membrane. They can be uh, sent and stored inside these special secretory granules and when some type of action potential or some type of stimulus stimulates the cell to release these granules, they can basically be released via the process of exocytosis. And these glycoproteins can also be stored in these organelles we call lysosomes. Remember, lysosomes are these organelles that have these special digestive enzymes which are responsible for actually breaking down different types of molecules that are found with inside our cell. So once again, to summarize, at, at position one, we have ribosomes attached to the cytoplasmic side of the ER. These dots basically synthesize the proteins and as the proteins are being synthesized and as they move into the lumen of our endoplasmic reticulum, special protein enzyme complexes basically attach those sugar molecules via the N-glycosidic linkages. And once that forms, they, uh, they basically move into the Golgi apparatus. So the proteins move out of the lumen of the ER and into the cytoplasm where they then travel into the Golgi apparatus via these special transport vesicles. And inside the Golgi complex, the N-linked sugars are modified and the O-glycosylation actually takes place. And once the Golgi complex modifies and sorts the glycoproteins, it then directs these glycoproteins to basically move into different locations depending on what their function actually is. And so they can end up in the lysosomes, they can end up being stored in secretory granules, or they can be stored in the bilayer membrane around that particular cell. So we see that glycoproteins are a very important class of biological molecules and glycoproteins basically consist of protein component as well as a carbohydrate component. So by modifying and adding the sugar component onto the protein, we increase uh, the functionality and change the properties of the protein molecules.